Good evening and welcome to We the People, brought to you by the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis. My name is Joan Higginbotham and I'll be your host for this evening's program. Well, it's almost summer, at least I hope it is, so our thoughts begin to turn to thoughts of water. Get that canoe out on the lake, go swimming, perhaps do a little fishing even. Those are all things that we can do here in the city because we have so many wonderful lakes. And it also thought, gave me the thought that we should be talking a little bit about water. Do we really know what our water, what kind of quality our water is and how valuable a resource it is? Well, we'll find out more about that tonight. My guest is Deborah Swackhammer, and Deborah is a professor at the Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota. She's also co-director of the university's uh, Water Resources Center, and she's a professor of environmental health sciences. I think you could cover almost any water topic we could talk about. I think eventually, yes. <laughs> Good, that's great. Well, so water, I know when I did my research for this, I was looking at the watershed districts, and it seems like they're the, they're the the bodies that sort of look after our water. Is that right? They're one of many bodies that look after our water. So the watershed districts are at sort of the local level. They cover um, a certain watershed, meaning where the water falls and flows down to a river or a lake. And so that would be um, uh, groups of, uh, of municipalities perhaps or townships but it's usually a pretty small area compared to say a county or mm -hmm. compared to a much larger unit they're maybe about the size of a county but yes they they own their water they live in that watershed it is their water so they look after water quality through volunteer monitoring they do planning around water uh, they have to approve certain projects if it affects the watershed so now as i look at the map minneapolis really has two it has the, the Minnehaha one that comes in from the west, and then it has the upper Mississippi one that comes in from the north. Is that? Yeah, the, the uh, metro area is a little different because it has something called watershed management organizations, and they are um, actually mandated by statute that we, we have these because the metro is so complicated, and we have seven counties, but they don't, you know, counties governmental boundaries don't follow watershed boundaries. Right, probably and not. And so, no, not at all. So they took the metro area and they said, well, these are the major watersheds and we want to manage the water in addition to the government, you know, function of the seven counties. So they're so, independent in a sense. Their boundaries are independent, yeah. yeah. Well, as I looked at this, the, 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 it seemed like there were three things that, that most of these groups did. And then they looked at stormwater management and nutrient management and invasive speedy, species. Is that mm -hmm. sort of the the big enchilada of what they do? I would say that's right. And so what are those things? So what exactly, stormwater management, what is it? So stormwater sounds, um, it's got a bad name, but stormwater is any water that, that uh, collects as a result of a storm. So you have a rainfall and you end up with water collecting on surfaces. Sometimes the water soaks into the ground and that's good, it goes to our groundwater mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and replenishes our aquifers. But also um, it runs off and the, the more surface that you have that's impervious that doesn't allow the water to soak in think parking lots oh, yes uh -huh. <laughs> um, or just development in general the more of that kind of surface you have the more the water flows very quickly and horizontally instead of vertically and it picks up a lot of pollution that way it picks up oil from your you know car you know mm -hmm. oil and gas from your cars it picks up uh, sand and salt from our terrible winters um, it picks up a lot of of dirt and pollution and then it, it eventually flows either to a river or to a lake and it's, it's carrying a lot of water that's polluted so it, it's um, storm water it needs to be managed so that it doesn't flow so quickly because that helps to contribute to flooding and it also you don't want it to pick up all those pollutants you want to get those pollutants out of there so you want to manage the storm water to try to infiltrate before it gets polluted and pollutes a lake or river so it really isn't just storm water it's any water that sort of flows down into the sewers or drains yeah yeah pretty much and then we i was saying to you earlier that we the league of women voters um did the stenciling and can you talk a little bit about what i think that's still an important project i think it is and i think it's very educational um, if you know that this water that you see flowing down the side of your street mm -hmm. and it's going into a little hole and you think oh fine it's going away it's going, right exactly right <laughs> out of sight out of mind right but if the stencil says this this drains to the stormwater system for Minnehaha Creek. You know, it's, it's draining into Minnehaha Creek. You're going to pay attention more because, because you're going you to say, want that. wow, we don't want all those twigs and leaves and oil and dirt and trash to go into our stormwater system. So we're, we're going to be more careful. So I think it promotes people to be more, um, you know, better uh, stewards of their water. Well, I was surprised because there's a big article on how you could be a stormwater stenciler, and I didn't realize it was that organized. But now the other thing that was interesting about when they talked about the stormwater, they talked about um, 
not having your leaves and raking up your leaves and stuff like that, and, and that's a bad thing to go into the, into the sewers also? It is. You know, you think it's natural, so it's not yeah, a bad thing. Yeah, that's what thing, I thought. Exactly. But it leads to that second issue, which is the nutrient management. So leaves, when they decay, or grass clippings, when they decay, they, uh, they release their nutrients. They're made of carbon and phosphorus and nitrogen. And those nutrients, once a leaf is dead or grass is mown and, and it's just decaying, um, those nutrients are released back to the environment. Now, nutrients are important. We need them for our plants. We water our plants and give nutrients to our plants and our gardens. But an excess amount of them getting into water will cause an excess growth of algae. So algae uh -oh, that's love when nutrients. we have the blooming lakes. Yep, that's exactly right. So we end up with um, green instead of blue water. And, uh, you know, it can smell. It can cause oxygen problems. Uh, and so it's the it's this excess nutrients, which are a problem. So one way to prevent those nutrients from getting into, say, the chain of lakes, that kind of thing, is to make sure that, that we don't allow those leaves and grass clippings to get into the stormwater system, which flows eventually to our, um, you know, our chain of lakes and our streams. So really, what it is, is it, we're fertilizing those plants. Yeah, over-fertilizing, yeah. yes, way over-fertilizing. Right. So these are, these are lakes that need to go on a diet. Yes, and yeah. so, well now, okay, so I should be picking up my grass clippings. And I, and I know that there are kinds of fertilizers that you can use that are better than other kinds, too. Well, you might know that um, uh, fertilizers for your lawn and gardens that contain phosphorus are now banned in the state of Minnesota. And the reason that is is that we over-fertilize, and they don't really need that much you know, phosphorus mm -hmm. fertilizer. So you're not allowed to buy those kinds of fertilizers anymore. Um, and there are other ways that you can just naturally fertilize, but it's, it's, we, the state has really taken a very... Um, uh, assertive approach to making sure that we try to limit the amount of phosphorus that's getting into our lakes. And Has rivers. it made a difference already? You know, that's a very tough question. I get asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, we've made uh, a lot of progress in managing what we think are things that are going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. But have we actually seen a difference? Um, a very slow drop in phosphorus, very slow decline in the concentrations. So it's, um, it's going to be slow because phosphorus, when it is taken up by algae, say in, you know, Lake of the Isles mm -hmm. or something, it sinks to the bottom and that phosphorus stays in those ah. sediments. So even if you reduce the amount of phosphorus coming in by stormwater, you have to eventually get rid of all the phosphorus over time that's in the sediments. So there's like a storage of phosphorus that we, so it's going to take a while. I mean, it's not going to turn around in a, in a year or two. It's more like a five-year kind of thing. But it will eventually. It will eventually. Now, the, they, in the stuff that I read, there were some places where they actually said that they had turned the lake around or, you know, they yes. were no longer impaired. That's right. So the word impaired is, is a, it's it's a legal term. Word. It is an interesting term, but it's actually a legal term. That means that that body of water does not meet water quality standards so that the concentrations of either phosphorus or, or chlorophyll or something else, bacteria, are above the actual uh, aquatic standards for the state and the nation. And so in order to get unimpaired, <laughs> yeah. to get restored, you have to bring those concentrations down. And so um, many of these restoration plans have either you know, worked to either put in um, buffer strips around a lake, for instance, so that the phosphorus that's coming in that stormwater coming down somebody's uh -huh. lawn, that phosphorus gets taken up by the buffer strip that's on land before it gets now, into the lake. Now, what would a buffer strip be? A, literally a strip of some kind or some kind of planting? Planting. So uh -huh. it might be you know, 10, 20 feet of planting between the, the grass and the lake water itself, and it might have wildflowers, it might have uh, native prairie plants, but it has something that's going to take up that phosphorus that's flowing down across you know, the land before it gets into the lake. Now, the other thing that I thought was interesting, too, is bacteria. That's another thing. Now, now what, what are we talking about when we talk about bacteria? So bacteria comes from many sources. It can come from uh, you know, pets, where you're walking your dogs and, and whatnot. It can come from geese. A lot of our bacteria can come from geese. Just, ah. you know, they land next to the lake, and there's a storm event, and then uh, there you, you can imagine that. We also have bacteria from, uh, not so much in the metro, but in uh, outstate, we have um, a lot of agricultural practices and certainly, you know, the livestock um, operations around the state, they, some of that bacteria can get into waterways. Um, so it can come from a variety of sources. You can also have overflow of the sewer system. We've separated our stormwater mm -hmm. and sewer systems in the cities, the Twin Cities, but you can still have events where the storm 
the, the sewer system can be overwhelmed. The flood in Duluth two years ago overwhelmed the sewer system, and so they So then they the bacteria goes into the water, A lot into of the raw lakes. sewage ends up going in. At that time, it went into the harbor. So basically, we're talking about sewage, which is, has the bacteria in it of some kind or another. Yeah, and it's either coming from animals or it's coming from humans. Yeah. Right. Well, now, that, that's... Now, <coughs> the last thing that was on the list, was, which is the one that's most curious to all of us, are the invasive species. Yes. Now that's another term of art, I guess. Yes. And, and it's uh, not only, it's plants and animals are both invasive species, right? That's correct. So these are um, either plants or animals that um, find a foothold in, uh, in Minnesota, either in our lakes or on land. There's also terrestrial invasive species, but the aquatic ones are what we're right. most concerned with. And they, um, they can propagate because they don't, either they don't have a natural predator, if they're an animal, or if they're a plant, they can outcompete the native plants. And so they start to take over. So you've seen lakes or marshes that are just filled with cattails. Well, that's, you, you want a diversity of plants, mm -hmm. and the cattails are an invasive that have taken over. Or purple loosestrife. Which is so pretty, but... It is pretty, but it takes over all the other plants. And so that's why you see swaths of purple. Mm -hmm. It can be pretty, but it's not a very healthy ecosystem. On the animal side, we have things like um, zebra mussels. Everyone's heard of zebra mussels, I'm sure, in Minnesota. Now, are they in the urban lakes at all? Yeah. They are. Because um, we don't boat as much in, in I, the city. I shouldn't say that just off the top of my head. Um, I don't know that they're in the actual, the Twin Cities chain mm -hmm. lakes. But they, I, I'm, I'm sure they're probably in the Mississippi River. Yes, and they're, um, uh, they're in the Mississippi. They're in the lower St. Croix. Um, they're in, in several lakes around the state. But I don't know that they're in the. Ch I think they're I guess not in the. In the I, we've metro. all heard about them, but we don't know what they do. So these are little mussels. They're about the size of your fingernail. Not big enough to eat. No, <laughs> and you wouldn't. They wouldn't taste so good. Um, but no, you couldn't. Oh my goodness, the work it would take. Um, they um, they take over the habitat of native mussels. So we have mussels, for instance, in the Saint Croix River. We have many species of beautiful mm. mussels that um, are quite valued because they filter the water and they they uh, help. Uh, turnover nutrients and things like that. And uh, these um, zebra mussels, they're called that because they have stripes. <laughs> and um, they take over the habitat and they, they kill off the other mussels because they can't reproduce. They just take over their space, basically. So basically they're just covering the they area where other the area. many right. different varieties of mussels might have been. That's right. So not so good. Now, and they clog intake and outtake pipes. And so if you're a business, you really don't like zebra mussels because if you have an intake water pipe for cooling or, or for processing water, that pipe gets um, uh, colonized by the zebra mussels and it blocks it. So Literally it's almost like it. calcification, you know, it, it, uh, it blocks the water both in and out. So um, then you have to go in at great expense and try to clean out the, um, the pipes. So it's, it's an expensive proposition to manage these things. Now, are we, are we doing any, I mean, we talked about, we don't know so much about the phosphorus, but how are we doing on some of these other invasive species? Um, I think we're kind of holding our own. We still see introductions of new species, but um, our Department of Natural Resources, who's got the responsibility for managing this, has really gotten much more aggressive about managing the ones we already have and also trying to make sure that we prevent any introductions. Well, so of course, there's the a, flying there's a carp is what we want to know about. Oh, uh, okay, you're going to go there. Um, so <laughs> Just very briefly. So the, the Asian and the big head carp are the two um, Asian carp species that are of, are of great concern of coming up the Mississippi, uh, as well as coming up uh, into the St. Croix and, um, and into the Great Lakes, for that matter. So there's a lot of concern about this. The, um, the DNR, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, the U.S. Congress. Uh, Everybody is interested. They're then. all looking at this very, very, very carefully. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and there are various options that they're considering. They're all terribly expensive, and there's no particular silver bullet to, but, to you prevent you know, I them. remember so when you can the, just slow them the, down. The sea much. lamprey was a big concern yep. in, the, in the Lake Superior, but now they did something to control that. We control them, but at, at the cost of billions a year. It's okay, a, so I guess it's, it's anything can expensive. be done if you have enough money, and that's always yeah. a problem. Right, and if a resource is valuable enough to you, you're going to spend the money to protect it, because the loss of the resource is, you know, pretty much, you know, invaluable. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really don't want to see these fish get up the Mississippi, not so much for the Mississippi itself. I mean, it would affect boating, it would affect fishing, but the big concern is that they would get into um, some of the inland, the big inland lakes like uh, Mille Lacs or mm. up there, and that would be devastating. And all that whole fishery and tourist industry would be gone. 
and that would be just hugely um, dramatic. Well, we have, it's interesting because we have a lot of reasons to be worried about any kind of invasive species because it's not just, it's recreation, it's also industry. Yes, it's, it's actually, and it's well-being. You know, we, we use our lakes for all sorts of things. You know, we walk around them and we, we love to look at them and we boat on them and we fish and swim and sail. Uh, and, and yet other, you know, we also use our water for industry. I mean, that's why we exist on the Mississippi River. That was for industry, for the right, mills. Right, so we got started. And all of that and the logging industry on the St. Croix. So all of that water was used initially for, you know, for industry purposes. And yes, these invasive species affect that as well. Well, and we drink the water here in the city. Yep. So it makes me always a little nervous when I think about that. But this water is flow this Mississippi River water is coming down. And that is our drinking water supply in the city, isn't it? Yes, it is, both Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I guess there are two questions. Are we ever in danger of having that, that source dry up, in a sense? Um, not in any near, t near time to the future. You know, there's a lot of talk about our groundwater supply and right. our drinking water supply. And one of the big problems that's happened over the past 20, 30 years is we've seen a switch from the metro area being very urban and drinking the, the uh, lake, the, excuse me, the Mississippi River water. And then we've gradually expanded out to our suburbs and they drink groundwater. They are drilling wells and So they're groundwater. using the aquifers. Yep. And so the White Bear Lake situation is an example where we've spread out and we're now using groundwater so that the metro area, uh, those seven counties, they now use two, two thirds of our drinking water is groundwater and only one third is the river because that's where our population is. And this is, um, I often talk about it this way, the, our um, surface water is like our checking account and our groundwater is like our savings account. So we're, we're spending our savings account not the right way to go. And, and not our checking account. We're supposed to be saving that savings account for the rainy days. And well, is there, we're not doing that. Is there an economical way of, of helping out White Bear by diverting Mississippi River water? That's one of the big propositions that out there that I think it makes the most sense. It is expensive, but it, it makes the most sense to provide surface water to these outlying communities as well as White Bear Lake itself. But the, uh, you asked if we're ever going to run out. The Met Council has done a wonderful study, it's a very robust scientific study that has looked at the capacity of the Mississippi River for providing water even if we had to give it to all these other communities. Mm -hmm. And we're fine. We I mean, in a really severe that. drought, you'd go back to the groundwater mm -hmm. for a while. But most of the time, we have excess capacity in our drinking water system. You know, I know that at one time, the League of Women Voters again was concerned about plans to, to divert water from the Great Lakes and somehow mm -hmm. bring it down to the southern areas. Is that still in any place in anybody's mind? Oh yes, people um, t talk about it quite a bit. As a result of the concern that you know, somehow all this wonderful, you know, 20 percent of the world's fresh water is right here in the upper Midwest. And uh, what if Arizona decided they would just well, build a big pipe? That was our concern, yes. <laughs> so that is a concern. So um, the Great Lakes states, Minnesota all the way to New York, as well as the provinces of Ontario and Quebec, they, um, they all agreed to, uh, to not allow this. So they, f they formed a compact, it's called. And then the U.S. Congress embraced this compact and made it U.S. law. It's federal law that you can't take water from the Great Lakes out of its drainage basin. So we couldn't even take Great Lakes water to here because we're in the Mississippi River ah. Basin. We're not in the Lake so Superior we've got, Basin. So we've got to depend on our river. Yep. So we're, um, they've <coughs> actually protected the water supply in the Great Lakes. And then the, the uh, country of Canada did the same thing. They have federal legislation that it matches ours. So it's never been tested by the courts, but um, there is a, a, a framework in place to protect the water of the Great Lakes. It's kind of an interesting idea that, that we all said, no, we're, we've, we've, we've decided you're not going to use our water. You know, it's a resource for the whole, I mean, for two countries, it's a resource that um, it drives a huge economic piece of our country. A third of our agriculture, is, uh, a third of Canadian agriculture and a quarter of our agriculture is in the Great Lakes Basin. About half our manufacturing capacity is in the Great Lakes Basin. So it's hugely valuable. It's not just about drinking water and oh, isn't it pretty. It's, it's, um, it's, it's very much. Um, it's, a, it's a lifeline in many senses. Absolutely. It's big transportation from you know, Duluth all the way out to St. Mm -hmm. Lawrence. So it's extremely valuable for many, many dimensions. Well, now we were just talking about those people downriver. <laughs> what is our responsibility to the folks in St. Louis and Memphis or whatever? And you have, uh, you've touched on something I feel very strongly about. And so I believe that as Minnesotans, we have an extra responsibility. 
we, to be stewards of our water, especially the Mississippi River. We, um, we're a very unique state in that we are the headwaters of the three biggest uh, watersheds of the entire North American continent. Oh, really? All we, three? The headwaters of the Mississippi, which yep. we're all familiar with, were the headwaters of the Great Lakes, which is, of course, all the way across North, mm -hmm. North America, and were the headwaters of Hudson Bay. The Red River of the North is what oh, feeds Hudson Bay. Hudson Bay. Yep. So we have a huge responsibility to protect other areas. Um, our water comes to us clean. It comes to us from the sky. Right. Um, we don't import water from any rivers or anything else. We get our water from the sky, and we have a responsibility for it. And everyone downstream, um, they, I just think we should be really good neighbors because we started with something very precious, and we should take even better care of it. And are we? Yes and no. I think um, the Canadians would say we're, you know, we're helping to pollute Lake Winnipeg as the Red River flows north into Canada, and yes, it's true, we do contribute to that pollution. But we're in discussions about how to reduce that pollution, how to manage those nutrients and get them down. Uh, we have a responsibility to the Gulf of Mexico. So if you've heard of the dead zone, big area of the Gulf of Mexico, which has no oxygen because of the nutrients coming down the Mississippi River, creating algal blooms which die and then use up the oxygen as the bacteria use up the, the uh, algae for food. And that um, is, I mean, we can, they can say that some of that's from us here? Well, we know it's about 7% uh, is coming really? from just Minnesota. Just of the 32 states that contribute to the Gulf of Mexico problem, we are 7%. 7%? Yeah, we're a pretty big part of it. And it's only part of our state, which is the problem. Is it, is is it because problem. of the agriculture? And it's the agriculture and the kind of the, the, uh, the topography, if you will, of the red of the excuse me, the Minnesota River. So the Minnesota River is most of our contribution of the nutrients that are going down to and the Gulf. And that's mostly an agricultural. Yep, it's agriculture, and it's uh, it's just set up to kind of feed <laughs> nutrients down down to the Gulf. Um, we're doing a better. We're trying very hard to reduce those nutrients. Our Department of Agriculture here in Minnesota has a nutrient reduction plan in place. A, new, a management plan for, uh, for nutrient application. Uh, the state Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has a nutrient reduction plan. So we're trying, we're trying to find ways to reduce those nutrients, you know, raise the education awareness, raise the stewardship awareness, and try to prevent those nutrients from getting But getting you know, worse. it's very hard to kind of, many of us have never even been there. It's kind of hard for us to yeah. feel that, that sense of, of responsibility to something that we are really so far from, I think. I know, and that's why it's, um, it's, it's hard to get people's attention about this. And the other thing is we have more water than any of the other 48 continental states. Really? We have more water. That so 10,000 lakes thing is no, uh, no it's myth. It's 12,000 lakes. We're very modest. Um, <laughs> we have more water, and so we take it for granted. So when we look and we can swim in the Mississippi River, we can catch fish and, and all of that, we can go up north and enjoy our lakes, we just take that for granted. But very few other states really have anything like that. And so it's hard for us to remember that anything we do to the Mississippi, that starts to affect Iowa. It mm -hmm. starts to affect Illinois. It starts to affect Missouri. Yeah. So it does go down. Now you've talked about fish. Mm -hmm. And that is another issue because that's, I, I've often heard that, well, you shouldn't really eat the fish. So unfortunately, we have this wonderful, you know, we have a wonderful resource of fish in this state yes. and, and wonderful set of species. We have, you know, the wonderful walleye that everybody yes. worships and, and loves. And the, the sad thing is, is that our walleye are, are contaminated enough with mercury that uh, we advise, the health department advises that you, um, you restrict your, your intake of, of certain fish depending on their size and depending on whether you're female or male, whether you're going to you know, have children or whether you're feeding children the fish. So we have different advice depending on where you are in your life. But uh, the mercury is coming from um, out of our state. It's coming from the atmosphere getting down into our lakes with this rain I was talking about. So mm -hmm. unfortunately the rain does contain some mercury and that gets taken up by the fish after some cycling within the lake. And um, it's quite toxic, and so you really don't want your... So it really is a serious concern. It's not it just, is. well, it's a good idea. It's really, you shouldn't eat it, more than a right. certain amount and of if, fish. If I, if I were having a child, I, would be, I probably wouldn't eat any local fish really? just to protect my child. And if I were um, feeding my children, I would just want to make sure that they had limited amounts of local fish because they do have mercury in them. It's so sad. I it mean, is that's sad, really but, one of our great resources. But the good news is, again, due to global efforts and, and federal efforts, the concentrations of mercury in the atmosphere are starting to come down. 
And so um, the most recent data from the DNR and the MPCA and the Department of Health, they have looked at the fish concentrations over decades, and the concentrations of mercury are starting to come down. So it is getting better. It is getting better, yeah. Well, and I guess that the same thing is, is our concern about swimming, because some of these lakes are so polluted that you shouldn't swim in them, too. That's pretty rare. Actually, most of our, um, our problems in the state are due to these excess nutrients. You may not want to swim in them. If you see, you know, duckweed and, right. <laughs> and Eurasian milfoil you. floating about, you may not want to or you may not want to put your boat in there because your propeller is going to exactly get tangled right. up. Yes. Um, but they're not, uh, they're not unsafe from a well, public health standpoint. Well, now, we talked about all these problems. And what, what can we do as citizens? I mean, if you were going to give us, you know, five things that everybody should do well, or first, even one well, or two. Okay, just five? I have about oh, 20. However no. many. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say first is you need to know where your water is coming from and where it goes. If you think about those two things every day, if you ask yourself that question, you ask your neighbors and your family, um, you'd be amazed how little we know. This is true. You live in the, in the Twin Cities, you live in the, in the city of Minneapolis, there are many water intakes. Do you know which intake it is from the, from the river? Many people don't even know we drink river water. Uh, we have some of the best treatment plants in the state, in the country, so our drinking water in the Twin Cities is of very high quality. Hmm. And, but most people just, they turn on right, a tap, right. if it's no there, problem. That's good. Uh, they make a pot of coffee, they dump the rest down the, the sink. They don't think about it. Um, and in fact, then the next question is, where did that go? Where did that, where did that pot of coffee that you didn't finish drinking, where did it go? It, well, it went into the sewer system, and that caffeine goes into the Mississippi River, and it goes right down to New Orleans. And so it's really thinking about where is your water coming from mm -hmm. and then where is it going when you flush the toilet, when you empty your sink, that kind of thing. When you wash your car in your driveway and you watch that sudsy water run off, True. where is it going? That's right, yes. Um, uh, when you go to some, you know, so as a citizen, those are two things you can do. The other thing is to work locally. Find out if you have a watershed district where you live. Join it. Volunteer to, to be one of the monitors of the water uh, system. Um, pay attention to local politics because um, those watershed uh, managers are appointed by the county So it is really your watershed. It's totally your water. Well, we yeah. could probably go on for five or 10 or 15 more, but we are running out of time. So I hope this does give you a better idea of where our water comes from and where it goes and what we can do to make sure that it is going to be there forever and it's going to be safe to swim in and safe to drink. Thanks to our guest this evening, Deborah Swackhammer from the University of Minnesota. I'm sure we did learn an awful lot about water in a very short time. Thanks to all of you for tuning in to We the People. This is Joan Higginbotham for the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis saying good night and join us again.